Pray. Father in heaven, we are here to hear your word, to hear your spirit speak to us. May your words cause us to live for you in all things. Amen. Who remembers Merv Griffin? Yeah, second service, there weren't too many that knew who that was. Here's another one, Mike Douglas. Remember Mike Douglas? I have a great Mike Douglas story. This is, we're off script, Patty, because this is third. I can go as long as I want. Uh, back in the 1970s, Worthington Foods, the president, went on the Mike Douglas show, and my dad was there in the audience. He was a pastor and they brought him some veggie chicken and they gave it to him and it's my dad and he's right there and he eats it all the time and they're like, what's it taste like? And he's, just like chicken, <laughs> just like chicken. So Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas, Barbara Waters, right? Barbara Waters specials, you remember those? Here's one that connects me to Dayton, Ohio. You guys remember Phil Donahue? Okay, fasten your seatbelts, Jerry Springer. <laughs> and one of my favorites, Geraldo Rivera. Remember Al Capone's safe? Woo! And most of us have heard of Oprah, Rush, Steve Harvey, the list goes on and on. Talk shows, talk radio, talk TV, Talk, talk, talk. I remember seminary, so much talking. <laughs> College, Andrews University, I loved it, but it was so many classes, so many lectures, taking notes, talking, talking. High school, so much talking. Unfortunately, I was talking the same time the teacher was talking. <laughs> And I remember my senior year, my math teacher, at the end of the year, he said he was giving me a D minus in math, and that was my graduation present. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Petchy, for that. I have to admit that I like to talk. Our Sherman family get-togethers are really just everyone trying to talk at the same time, louder and louder, so much excitement, so much interrupting. So if I interrupt you, that's how I grew up. Talking, talking, talking. It's such an easy thing to do to talk. Christians, we do a lot of talking. At church, we do a lot of talking. Preachers, we like to talk. It helps if we can talk. It's part of our profession. But today, I am not going to talk to you about talking. Look at the front of your bulletin. Hopefully, we have the new bulletins, or else I'll be in really bad shape. Our new bulletins on the front, on the bottom, it should say what? Live the gospel. Live the gospel. And I'm going to just simplify it to live it. So that's what you're taking home. Live it. I saw a guy on TV about 20 years ago. He was a new Christian, started going to church, listening to the sermons, listening to the Bible studies, listening to people talk, hearing all the Bible stories. And after about six months, he went up to the pastor and he said, when are we going to start doing the things that they were doing that we're talking about all the time? When are we going to do it? And he was talking specifically about miracles. And we see miracles, but there's a lot of other things that God calls us to do. When are we going to live it? So let me ask you a series of questions. And then we'll try to find some answers down the road. What does it mean to you to live the gospel? What does living the gospel look like? Where do we live the gospel? And then most importantly, am I living the gospel? Could do a book review here today. I had an extra book, but I forgot it at home. But I brought two. The first one is called Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Prophet, Martyr, and Spy by Eric Metaxas. 
Bonhoeffer, a really, really, really good book, an interesting book. For those of you that know about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a pastor in Nazi Germany during the time of Hitler, and he was confronted with a choice with his religion. How was he going to live in the midst of evil? And they sent him to the United States to have him in a safe place, but he thought, I can't be over here safe where my church and flock is over there suffering. So he went back to Nazi Germany and he wrestled with getting involved in the resistance to Hitler. And he got involved and he paid with his life ultimately. But this book, he wrote another famous book, maybe you've heard about The Cost of Discipleship where he says, Christ's invitation to us is, follow me and die. So this bit about living it, it's not just an easy, happy, prosperity gospel thing. So where can we start? Where can you start? I'm going to give you an easy one and a hard one at the same time. Start with your family. If you're a parent or a grandparent, you have been given a lifelong mission to live the gospel for your kids. My dad was a preacher. I don't remember hardly anything he said. I remember some funny things he did that I'm not going to tell you. But, well, I'll tell you one. He was in a little church in Ohio. One of his first churches were off script again, Patty. And they brought out the communion and it was covered, the communion, and they brought it up to the front and when they took the cloth off the top of it, the communion juice was in whiskey shot glasses. <laughs> whiskey shot glasses. And he said when he got to the verse, take and drink ye all of it, he had to fight not to crack up. But I'll tell you about my dad. I don't remember hardly any of his sermons or other things, but I remember he played football with me and my brother every day after school. He's not here anymore, and it's hard for me to hold a football. He would go golfing with us, and since he's passed, golf has sort of lost its fun for me. But I remember how he treated my mom. I remember how he treated us kids. And I remember how he treated, I know this is going to be shocking to you, certain church members that were not nice to him. Can you believe that anyone would mistreat a pastor? Can you believe that? So in your family, children with your parents, children, you are given a task to respect, honor, care for your parents. Siblings. Many times that text, love your enemies, applies for siblings. And let's keep it simple and practical. How can you live it in your family? Kindness, respect, forgiveness. Man, you need forgiveness in a marriage. You need forgiveness in parenting. Parents, you need to ask your kids, and I've done this, my kids, forgiveness for my shortcomings. Service. Boy, if there's a field of service, the family is a place you can serve and self-sacrifice. Off script here again. My wife and I at night used to say to feed the baby and go warm up the bottle, I'll give you 10 bucks. I'll give you 20 bucks. And we would negotiate. <laughs> Parenting is self-sacrifice. And just ask Jesus how much he's had to sacrifice for us, for his children. Well, there's family. Friends, Live the gospel with your friends, your neighbors. Man, if you have good neighbors, praise the Lord. If you don't, God has called you to live it, to live it. Coworkers, here's book number two. Maybe some of you have read this. If Disney Ran Your Hospital by Fred Lee. Uh, Fred just passed a couple years ago and uh, my wife and I had the privilege. His son was our next door neighbor, so we got to know him and uh, got to know his wife. But this book, If Disney Ran Your Hospital, he talks about 
when you go to Disney, you're going for an experience. And for parents, the great experience about going to Disney is the ride back to the parking lot at the end of the day. <laughs> but for kids, for others, it's an experience. And if something goes wrong at Disney, their cast members, workers, are trained to live out generosity, kindness, hospitality. We can apply these same principles. I like to say if Disney ran our church or our schools or our homes. At school, what an opportunity um, for students with teachers, teachers with students. You remember your teachers? You guys remember anybody here when Don Boston was here? Anybody remember Pastor Don Boston? Anybody? His wife, Dottie Boston, was my sixth grade teacher. What a sweet lady. What a sweet lady. And here's a hard one that Jesus talked about, strangers. I know we've got to be careful here, but God, we interact with strangers. Uh, I'm at the hospital almost every day, and when you get on an ele elevator, you know how awkward that is? Especially if you've got to go up to like the 12th floor and you stop four times. And just be friendly, be just nice, hello. And, and I started talking to somebody, and... Uh, Boy, they started talking back. It's not a hard thing. But then again, I'm an extrovert. So listen to this quote by Barbara Brown about living it. The hardest spiritual work in the world is to love your neighbor as yourself. To encounter another human being not as someone you can use or fix or help or save or convince or control, the hardest spiritual work in the world is to love your neighbor as yourself. So this, this thought of living it, living the gospel, living the love of Christ, many times I can find stories of how not to do it that teach the lesson better than how to do it. So here's story number one. My family and I were visiting an Adventist church, not in this state, let me just make this clear, not in Florida. We were visiting a church. Nobody knew who we were. We went in the door, and the greeters greeted us, and they said, you're not Adventists, are you? <laughs> hey, I went to the seminary. Come on, I'm a pastor. What, do you mean? what kind of greeting is that? One of my family members, who I will not mention, it's not my wife, and I promised her I would tell no stories about her this time, one of my family members, they said to the person, you're wearing jewelry, you can't be an Adventist. <laughs> wow. Okay, so I'm going to ride this jewelry theme because I hope as a church we're over this. I hope we're beyond this. I hope we're through this. I hope that living the gospel is bigger than this. When I was a young pastor, an intern, at an evangelistic series, when the series came to an end, we were sitting with some people that we had been studying with and the evangelist came over to a lady, took her hand and cut off her wedding ring with like some, I don't know what it was. I'm just glad he didn't take her finger off. But, and I, shot, I sat there, this isn't happening. And he said to her, I know you've been struggling with this decision I just wanted to make it easy for you and make the decision for you. Okay. And here's what she said, and I'll let you finish the sentence. I think you can get the last word. She was crying and she said, what am I going to say to my husband? What am I going to say to my husband? Even if we were right on jewelry, which I don't think we were, but even if we were right... That's not the way to live it. So I'm going to make it personal now. When I was an academy principal somewhere far away, it was camp meeting. I was in charge of the platform. School is technically out. The school year is technically over. Uh, two young boys who had just graduated were going to do worship for Sabbath platform and camp meeting. And first one of them showed up with an electric guitar, which I knew this might not go well. 
but the other boy had huge earrings on. And I had a couple of people telling me, you cannot let him go on the platform like that. And I thought, and I thought, I thought, God, what do I do here? I enjoy working for the church. <laughs> um, I let him go on. I let him go on. Six months later, that boy was killed in a car accident. 22 years old. And I thought, man, what would his parents have thought? What if, could, what if, what if the impact could have been on him? So let's, let's live it. Let's get real. Let's move beyond that. Let's get to, can, and I've got written here, can we just stop this? Can we just stop? Can we just stop judging? Can we stop? Can, choir, can you stop judging me up here? Okay. <laughs> It's very unnerving, you know. I know. I know. Can we just stop talking so much at church and just live it? Can we be kind and friendly and polite? And I want to say this just very simply. Can we welcome everyone to church? Can we welcome people that have a different lifestyle than us? Yes, we, we can welcome without approving. And people say, oh, what if they start promoting their lifestyle? You know what we do? We promote our lifestyle. There's no greater life than to live in Christ. And if they want to share why their life is so great, okay, but give us a chance to share back. So can we just welcome everybody? Can we be... Can we be like Jesus? Can we be like Jesus? I remember when I was a college student in the 80s at Andrews University visiting the village church and me and two of my other buddies were in church and this lady in front of us, I had no idea who she was, she turned around and said, would you three guys like to come over for lunch today? Do you know what it is if you eat in a cafeteria? 10 months a year <laughs> and somebody asks you if you'd like to come over for homemade food. I don't remember her name, but I remember that act of kindness. She lived it. She lived it. And I remember when I was an intern pastor in Cicero, Indiana, and man, you think my sermons are bad now. You should have heard them back then. <laughs> um, I know, how, I know what you guys talk about after church, believe me. I know. That church was so patient with me and so kind to me and treated me so fantastic. I'll never forget their kindness. Thank you, Cicero, Indiana. Can we live the gospel with everyone? Well, what do you say, Jesus? Well, here we go, Matthew 5, 13 to 16. You, me, you, Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth. And if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. I don't want us to be a church that's good for nothing. I don't want to be a Christian that all I do is talk. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, the darkness never changes by you telling it how dark it is. And if your electricity goes off and you're stumbling around the house complaining how dark it is and just talking about the darkness, nothing's going to change. But you light a light. Take your, you take your cell phone at night. You know, you turn on the flashlight. You find your way around the house. 
Here's a great quote from Hugh Halter from, I don't have the book, but I recommend it. It's called Brimstone, and he's not advocating brimstone. He's advocating love, but he says here, here's the quote. I'll say it twice if you're writing it down. We are here to be salt and light, not judge and jury. I'll say it again. This is Hugh Haltner from his book, Brimstone. We are here to be salt and light. Thank you, Jesus. Not judge and jury. So whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, we cannot escape the call from Jesus to live the gospel. And I'm going to give you some examples here at the Forest Lake Church of where this happens. Gift and thrift. If you've never been down there, go down there and see what they're doing. Volunteer down there. Tuesday mornings, Thursday afternoons, you know hundreds of people go through there and receive assistance and help and care. Prayers and squares. Go quilters. Yay, quilters. Howie Baez, he's watching. I visited him this week. He has a beautiful quilt on his couch, American flag, and he was in the Air Force, and there's the Air Force symbol. What an amazing ministry, prayers and squares. Health ministries, deacons. You know the deacons do more than take up offering, right? Twice a month, twice a month, the second Sunday and the fourth Sunday, every month they get up at 6 o'clock Sunday morning and go downtown and feed the homeless. If you're interested in going, talk to them because they're usually short. Not a lot of people want to get up at 6 o'clock on Sunday morning. Deaconesses behind the scenes, helping with funerals, helping with other things. Our greeters, here's a secret, we're all greeters. You're all greeters from this day forward. But those that stand out there and greet, our Sabbath school teachers, our AV people, And then what about the countless individuals in this church that visit and help people? I I just visited somebody a few weeks ago. The last member in their family died. They are the last of the Mohicans. They are it. And when I got there to visit with the person, there was a lady already there from the church helping her with her laundry, making her pancakes, just keeping her company. We, We never hear those stories. We never see them. They're happening over and over again. Many of you feed the homeless, give financial aid, teachers, administrators, hospital workers. I'm in the hospital almost every day, and I see the nurses and the doctors and the cafeteria workers and the nutritionists and the people at the front. And I don't know, I get lost in Florida hospital. I don't know. It's an interesting, and many people help me find my way in and find my way out. Parents, again, grandparents, great-grandparents. Whatever job you have, wherever you're at, you can live it. You can live it. I already mentioned Dottie Boston. Um, I'll I'll mention a few other examples. Carolyn Shields, my typing teacher in academy, greatest thing I ever learned was how to type. And we were a squirrely group. (laughs) And she hammered those skills into us. I remember Luke Fessenden, my academy Bible teacher, Bill Richardson, my college guidance teacher, Ivan Blazin in the seminary who taught me the gospel from Greek. I'm glad somebody knows it. Many, many other people I could mention over and over again. And I'm in an interesting place in my life. My grandfather's gone. My father's gone. My uncle is gone. I'm the remaining eldest male in the family, but the impact those people had on my life, I can never forget. And it's sort of funny, you know, at sports events, the camera, it's always, they always say, hi, mom, right? The athletes, it's always, hi, mom. What are we? What are dads? (laughs) Huh? They never say, hey, dad. Moms, you are the, you're the glue, you're the heroes. So what does your list look like? Who is on your list of people that have lived the gospel in your life and made a difference? But let me throw something a little tougher on you guys. Who has you on their list? 
Who has your name on their list of living it in their lives? 1 John 3, 16 and 18. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren and sisters. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and truth. Let's live it. Philippians 2, 14 through 15 says, Do all things without complaining. I need to work on that. Do all things without disputing. I need to work on that. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of, sound like our world here, a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. The crooked and perverse don't need us to tell us how crooked and perverse they are. They need to have an encounter with Jesus Christ so the Holy Spirit can change them. And we can do that by loving them. Who was awake in history class when they spoke about Gandhi? Everybody know who Gandhi is in India? Gandhi once said, I really like Christianity. It's just the Christians that I have some trouble with. (laughs) 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then, we are, you and I, are Christ, our ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we deplore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We're all greeters. We're all ambassadors. We're all disciples. Whether we're ordained or not, God has called us to live it. Simply put, we are called to live it. Classic story, Cory Ten Boom, The Hiding Place. Maybe some of you have read that book or seen the movie, Cory Ten Boom. She tells the story. She was in a Nazi prison camp and her sister died in that camp. And when she survived, the, they were in camp because they had hidden Jews in their house. And when the war was over, she wrote a book and she went on speaking tours and was talking about the love of God. And you've probably heard this classic story. At the end of one of her talks, a gentleman came up to her who was a Nazi guard in the prison camp that she was in. And she recognized him. And he had been very cruel to her and her sister. And he came up to her and said, Corey, I found Christ. I want to ask you to forgive me for all that I did to you and your sister. And Corey Ten Boom said that her arm was locked down and she was wrestling in her mind what am I going to do and she made a decision to extend her hand and say I forgive you and she said she didn't feel good about it she didn't feel happy about it but she knew that it was what Christ demanded of her to do to live it well I've never been in a Nazi prison camp I'm sure all of us have encountered people that we maybe would like to use the word Nazi about. And I'll never forget one time when I was preaching about the love of Jesus and the sermon was over and I was standing at the front of the church. A person came up to me who I recognized as someone who had caused great pain for my father as a pastor. Actually, help run him out of one of the churches. And he was waiting to talk to me, and I was thinking, I can blow him off, or I can just walk out, or I can just not talk to him. 
And then, oh, the Holy Spirit, I hate this. Um, he brought back that story to Corey Ten Boom. Now, I'll tell you, there's been lots of times I have not done the right thing more than not. But in that instance, I said, what are you doing? If you're preaching this and this is what you're teaching people, you got to live it. And did I like it? No, I didn't like it. And did I still have hurt? Yes, I still had hurt. And that person never knew that I knew the story because I was just a dumb little kid. But you know what? Kids listen to their parents when they come home. And pastors talk to their wives in the car on the way home from church. And those little kids in the back that you don't think they're living, listening or watching, they're watching. God calls us to live it everywhere, every time with everyone. Live it. Take that away. But here's a nice little quote too, and I'll say it twice if you want to write it down also. This is from Paul Colo. The world is changed by your example, not by your opinion. I actually got that from Facebook, so it's got to be true. <laughs> the world is changed by your example, not by your opinion. Come on, church, let's live it. Let's stop the judging. Let's stop the stupidity. Let's start loving. Let's start wel welcoming. In all that we do, may people say, there goes a people who live what they believe. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are not perfect. Forgive us for our imperfections. We desire to live for you in our family, in our neighborhoods, in our work, in our schools, with strangers. Everywhere we go, may we live for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.